Great. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, hopefully everyone can hear, hear us okay, uh, see us okay, and also see our presentation. Um, if you can't, please let us know in the chat. So my name's Sophie Dixon. I'm an artist and co-founder of Never Seen, and I work with film and XR. So I completed a research master's at the Netherlands Film Academy in 2017, and that's where I started to get interested in the relationship between films, XR, and game engines. And I also lecture at Met College and Brighton University. I'm Ed Silverton. I'm a software developer, also co-founder of Never Seen. And I've been working in the uh, cultural heritage sector for about a decade. Uh, I'm mainly interested in storytelling with uh, digital collections. Yeah, so we, um, we founded Nemesine in 2017, and we work predominantly with web and immersive technologies for the cultural heritage sector. So over the years, we've worked on projects uh, focused on creating experiences um, and tools for storytelling with museum collections and often making visible stories which are lesser known. Um, and before, before we go into the tech talk, so today the focus of our talk is about a recent project called Grace. Um, but before we go into that, we thought we'd give a very quick uh, overview of some of the projects that we've worked on. So an early XR project made in 2017 was used in the HoloLens, this is called the Chorus, and we used, uh, we used the HoloLens to overlay physical plinths in a gallery environment with holographic content. So I've been working with the story of a small village called Sebska in present day Czechia, and previously it had been called Vincendorf and it vanished following World War II. And after many years of research, I gathered an archive of images oral histories and film and made those outward facing uh, on an archive called subsco.org and the chorus is a work which uses content from that archive and questions how mixed reality could be used to present a story with many different perspectives so as a viewer moves through an immersive soundscape they trigger film 3d objects and interviews from the collection um, this is a project called Nomad, um, another HoloLens project uh, that we worked on in collaboration with Abira Hussein in uh, 2018. Uh, this took the form of a holographic uh, nomadic family that journeyed across Somali community groups in London. Um, the experience contained objects digitised from, uh, from the British Museum and sound from the British Library. Uh, so when tapping on these objects, these holographic objects, uh, members of the nomadic family would demonstrate how they're used uh, and there'd be sound uh, accompanying it. And one of the things that we're very interested in is how to make things more accessible. So recognising that particularly at that time using a, a whole lens was not that easy to access. We experimented with creating accompanying uh, web-based AR sort of um, postcards of objects and stories. So looking at different ways of disseminating the same stories and content. Another commission by the Science Museum was to take objects which had already been digitized. So uh, photogrammetry had always been, already been taken place and fixing, repairing, optimizing objects that have been made using that process, but importantly, animating them to show how those objects used to be used. So this is an example of a, a leech jar in their collection. Um, this is a project called Exhibit. Uh, this is a tool we uh, created for the University of St Andrews uh, during lockdown. Um, the goal is to allow their students to tell stories with 3D objects and images uh, digitised from their adjoining library and museum. Uh, we also use this as part of the Brighton Festival in collaboration with MOOP, uh, the Museum of Ordinary People. We digitised objects um, belonging to participants in their exhibition during the festival, and then we used those in the exhibit tool to tell their stories. So that's a kind of quick overview of some of the projects. And as we go on, we're going to talk about Grace, and this is a more recent project which was created during lockdown and is the focus of our tech talk. And what we've done is we've structured the talk into development, pre-production, 
Uh -huh, sorry. <laughs> development, pre-production and uh, post-production. But to start with, we'll provide a bit of context. But as we go, um, there's a Q&A panel. So please do ask questions as we go and we'd be happy to answer those. So the background for the project is, this is a film about uh, Grace Darling and she became one of the greatest female celebrities of the Victorian era. And the film itself exists as a single screen film and a three screen version for an installation. And it was commissioned by the RNI Grace Darling Museum, Arts and Heritage and Arts Council England. So this is a kind of uh, teaser for the film. It was shot entirely using Unity Game Engine. And in this presentation, we'd like to focus on the use of 3D digitization for filmmaking, storytelling use, using museum and archival collections and computer generated filmmaking. So these are just a few extracts. Uh, the film itself is 10 minutes, 10 minutes long. So Grace Darling is a painting of her here. She was the daughter of a lighthouse keeper. And from around the age of 11, she lived in Longstone Lighthouse in the Farne Islands, Northumberland. And on September the 7th, 1838, when she was just 23, she rode out in a storm early one morning with her father to rescue survivors from, a, from the SS Forfarshire, which was a paddle steamer, which had run aground approximately half a mile from the lighthouse home. And the story goes that she, she saw the wreck from her bedroom window and she insisted that they risk their lives. They row out, they help the survivors. And following this event, she was hailed as a heroine and she became nationally and then internationally famous for this act. So the status of heroine quickly became one of celebrity and her quiet life living in this very remote lighthouse was changed forever. So after the event, visitors would go out to the lighthouse and they'd ask for her signature, they'd ask for locks of her hair, they'd ask for pieces of her clothing, and her name and her image were used to sell commercial products from soaps to chocolates to poems and plays. And she died in 1842, uh, just three years later, at the age of 26. But despite this, she still her legacy still lives on. And what's interesting about the story of Grace Darling is that it's made its way into plays, into songs, into books, films. And there's a, a really wonderful book written by uh, Cunningham, and he describes Grace Darling as this kind of existing in this realm of memory where she has this status that can metamorphosize and means different things to different generations. So the commission, the background for the commission was to create uh, an artistic response to her story, her well-known story, and specifically using the Grace Darling Museum's collection. And what we wanted to do was create a work which would immerse audiences in her story and see her life through a contemporary lens, but also importantly, drawing attention to some aspects of her story, which are a little less known, a key one being the impact of fame and celebrity on her life. So as, as a kind of any, film project, we started with the development and research stage. And this is the stage where we put together the treatment. So in the beginning here, we'll talk a little bit about the process of how we put the treatment together, and then we'll move into the more technical aspects of pre-production, production and post-production. So this is the Grace Darling Museum in Northumberland. And what was really important in the beginning was that we, that we found a format that worked for the museum. Uh, so this is a, it's a small museum, but it's popular and it relies heavily on volunteers. It has a large number of dedicated volunteers, but not many of them were particularly comfortable using technology and they already felt quite busy in their day to day activities. So we needed something that was fairly low maintenance and could be sustained without much supervision for um, a, a month long period. So we decided on an immersive film format. So creating something that visitors could walk in and out of that would play on loop would be suitable for young and old uh, and use this multi screen format that you can see here. So what we did in the early stage was visited the museum to hold 
workshops. So these are just some of the museum's volunteers. But I think, well, certainly the aim here was to understand her story better, but also to discover the museum's collection through her story. So what we did here was we established the kind of key linear events of her life and then explored the collection, the people, places and objects which fit into those different stages. So it's some kind of, uh, you know, post-it notes and workings out from the workshop. And the structure that we had was these key beats. So you have her sort of childhood on the lighthouse, the event, the storm, and then ultimately her fame and death. So you can have done a sort of linear timeline, linear story, uh, and then thought of these different themes, sounds, objects, and moods. And uh, for each stage of the story, so some of the objects from the collection, things like a clock, letters, inkwell. Um, the cobalt is the boat that she rode out on. It's the name of the boat that she or the type of the boat that she used for the rescue. And then obviously lots of letters and paintings. So these were productive workshops where we actually got to explore the collection. And one of the things about her story is there's many, uh, many, many books <laughs> written over this time period from, from when she died to today. So there's a lot of background reading, but the story that really stood out was um, a book called Her True Story, which was written in collaboration with her older sister. Thomas and Darling and the book includes lots of unpublished family letters and it sets out to sort of set the story straight to remove the glamorization and romanticism which had become associated with her deed and actually just sort of focus on her as an ordinary woman who was doing her job doing what people would have expected her to do so letters um, items from the museum's collection but also from the Northumberland archives became a key structure or key, key piece of content in this work and in these letters you start to hear the letters written between Grace Darling and her family you start to hear her voice and actually see that she's a young woman going through this very dramatic change from being an unknown lighthouse keeper's daughter to an international celebrity and within these letters it glimpses into the family's opinion about her fame so her father writes you can hardly form an idea how disagreeable it is for my daughter to show herself in public and there's a sense that the fame which dominated her life wasn't always welcome. So we use these letters alongside newspaper extracts from the time to, to form a script. And uh, to form the narrative, we took the linear storyline that we identified in the workshops and then used written testimonies from these letters verbatim to create a script. And I think really the aim here, it wasn't to sort of tell the story of her life because that's what the museum already does so well. It was more to creates a poetic treatment, something which has an emotional resonance and leaves this sort of space for interpretation between these different um, bits of her story. And sound was very important. During the development phase, we, we used this um, amazing manuscript. It's a manuscript belonging to her father, who played the violin, and he wrote, wrote out all these songs by hand. And I worked with a musician based in not in Berlin, not in Northumberland, in Berlin. And with her, we started to take these traditional folk songs in this book and weave them into something um, which would incorporate these different voices and extracts of the script. So the actual script itself kind of became woven into a score. And that's the thing that holds, that's a thread, I suppose, for the 10 minute long film. So we also decided early on that the film would be set in uh, the lighthouse home, just purely in her lighthouse home. And what we wanted to do was create a sort of story world based on her life there. And we wanted to use the idea of the lighthouse, but also of home and to connect audiences to her story through objects, the environment and her letters, and take the mirror away from this sort of popularized image of her rowing alone out at sea with her hair waving in the wind, but just really try and make it feel real by positioning it in the lighthouse. So that meant that, you know, after we had the original, the initial uh, treatment and script in place, and we knew what we wanted to achieve, uh, we started to then obviously think about how do we technically do this? How do we, how do we go about that? So we knew that we wanted something cinematic uh, with high production values and we knew we wanted it to be set in a lighthouse with sea and lights and all sorts of um, effects so 
it was quite clear that the creative use of lights would be essential. And for this reason, from the technical approach, we chose to use the Unity game engine, um, but specifically the high definition render pipeline. So um, the, the HDRP, high definition render pipeline, um, gives you a couple, a couple of things. Um, that were useful for us. Uh, Real-time global illumination, <laughs> real-time global illumination, uh, and ray tracing. Um, so, it, in a nutshell, uh, this makes the light in your scene behave more realistically. Uh, so you don't need to do things like uh, bake light maps. Um, and uh, the lighting is uh, real-time. So um, you also get indirect lighting effects. So light is behaving like it physically would it's bouncing around a room reflecting off things and uh if you know if you have a brightly colored object the, the color from that object is going to bleed onto its surroundings and there's lots of more realistic effects you can achieve with it um you also have um, volumetric lighting so uh you can probably see in this picture that the the light from the um from the lamp is kind of illuminating the fog um so this is very powerful kind of feature for kind of creating a kind of cinematic mise-en-scene. <laughs> um, uh, and we were quite lucky because um, this is around about the time that the, the, uh, the new generation of graphics cards were coming out, the NVIDIA RTX, and we uh, got our hands on a 3090, which pretty certain none of this would have been as possible without. <laughs> so with the technical sort of decisions in place at the start, we moved into pre-production and this is where we created everything that needed to be in place for the filming. So it was the, the part of the project in which we created the virtual environment uh, and everything associated with that. So the film takes place in this uh, lighthouse. Um, it's, it's off the coast of Northumberland um, and it's Longstone Lighthouse. And before we started making this, we thought, well, we're gonna have to make the lighthouse now. And also the lighthouse has changed a lot since when Grey Starling lived there. So now it's got a red and white stripes and it's got a base and it didn't have this originally. So we got a map here to show sort of how far out it is. It's a very remote place. So in order to get reference images very early on, um, we went out to the lighthouse. It's quite hard to get there. One, one person has a key and you have to find a good, a good day to cross, but it, you still, you can go there today. And Knowing that there was a limited amount of time in the location, we used 360 photography to take these reference images. So essentially going for each level of the lighthouse, taking reference images, trying to take as much imagery um, photography as possible to then use for referencing when modeling. What's interesting as well is that the lighthouse, I mean, it's it's an empty shell in a sense. There's no sense of home in there. It's, it's empty, um, but you can still get a sense of where the windows were, what the doors were like, etc. what the layout is like. So it all came in very useful. We also contacted Trinity House Archives and we got these floor plans. And these are floor plans from the original lighthouse and they became essential in the modeling stage. So you've got these sort of side, side views, but also top down ones as well. And to model, we used Blender. So um, Blender is an open source 3D modeling software. It's free and it's something which is, it has an amazing community around it. So I've been using it for about seven years now. And when I teach, I always recommend it to my students as well to have a look at because it is getting incredibly powerful. And what we did was separate the lighthouse into floors to make it easier to model. And wherever possible, I used a modular approach. So trying to create generic windows or railings or doors, anything that could be reused again um, and thinking of it from that kind of modular, modular approach. And you can see here that I've used the sort of plan exactly against the model to help get some accuracy there. 
as a kind of relatively early part of the modeling. And what we were looking for was realism. And we use the term reconstruction, rather no, <laughs> recreation rather than reconstruction, because actually there's a fair amount of lic artistic license which went into this uh, process, which I'll talk a bit about in a minute. So this is Blender, um, the sort of free, main 3D modeling on the right, and you can see the UV maps on the left. And because we were using the HDRP or high definition render pipeline and aiming for realism, I didn't worry about optimization as much as I would if we were working on a web project or a VR project, but I did try within reason to get the meshes as optimized as possible without sacrificing quality. So um, the, the objects which were most optimized were those created with photogrammetry, and I'll talk about the photogrammetry process a bit in a minute. But where possible, assets were grouped into one texture to reduce the overall number of textures in the project. And so sort of in a nutshell, Blender, as part of the workflow, um, was used for modeling, UV unwrapping, and assigning textures. So getting the textures ready for the model in Blender. Um, and on that note on texturing, so larger tile textures were assigned in Blender. So for example, the bricks on the outside of the lighthouse or um, concrete on the floors, they, they were sort of assigned in, text, in uh, Blender because of the tiling, but the smaller, more detailed objects were textured in Substance Painter. So texturing was between Substance Painter uh, and Blender. And the way that the workflow between Blender and Unity worked in this project was from Blender, uh, models were exported as FBX and then FBX were imported into Unity and materials, textures were saved as uh, PNG and also added in Unity. So you can see that this is the, this is a uh, scene from Unity. And when you select different objects, it pulls up the material settings in Unity. So you can pull in different uh, normal maps. The so normal maps are used to create the texture on the objects or the sort of surface rough, surface bumps and details, um, but also uh, mask maps for things like metallic and uh, roughness and then the base map as well. So all the maps that came when we were creating these objects sort of were dropped in in, in Unity. And the only bit of modeling that didn't take place in Blender uh, was the terrain. So the terrain was modeled in Unity itself. And here we use the Unity uh, or use Unity terrain tools. So you can see that from this view, it's kind of a very general shape of the terrain. Um, and you can model that directly in, in Unity. And so here's some screenshots of the process. Um, you've got the option to use different brushes to kind of raise or lower terrain. So you, you have a flat plane and you can just sort of sculpt different bits. Um, and I did that by using a, a sort of top down image, a map of the islands, just to get a rough idea of how they were all laid out. And then you can also paint textures so you can get different textures and use a brush to paint those over the terrain. And this is very good for when you want to block out large amounts of environment quickly. So this was the this was the approach there, but one of the things that we found was that as you kind of you're going in to to the lighthouse and as the camera's going very close over rocks, you want more detail in those areas. So to get more detail, um, we use these three D sort of rock assets basically. So where the camera was closer, we were using assets or rocks to give a bit more detail, but the overall shape of the landscape was made using terrain tools. Who were customized, weren't they? The Yellow moss, I seem to remember. Yeah, so um, we would, uh, I did some color matching as well because the terrain, we wanted the terrain that had been made in Unity to match with the rocks that had been added as assets. So there was quite a lot of color matching just to make sure that the 3D rocks sort of fit nicely on top of the terrain that had been modeled. Plus, plus in the, on the real island, the rocks are all covered in this. Yellow moss. Yeah, so you use some different uh, layering techniques and the material properties to add different layers. So you had a rock and then on top of that, the moss. Um, and, and just sort of trying to, to try and get the materials as realistic as possible and as much harmony as possible between 3D assets and the model terrain. So 
with, an, with regards to, I mentioned earlier, um, recreation rather than reconstruction, because actually there's very little reference to how the interior of the lighthouse would have been. Um, this was a main reference image created by H.P. Parker, and it shows the rescued survivors uh, from the SS Forshire warming in front of the fireplace after the storm. And this was really one of, this was actually the only interior image that we had to work with. So an early concept was to take items in the museum, and these were the ones identified in the workshops, and use them as props, use them as sort of digital objects for storytelling inside the film. And this was an example of one of the objects that we digitized. It's a cot used by Grace Darling's parents. And we, with the museum object specifically, we used a process called photogrammetry. So, Photogrammetry is this process in which you take hundreds of photographs. I mean, depending on the, the sort of complexity of the object and the level of detail that you're going for, you're looking for often in excess of 250 photographs. And you then run all those photographs through software to create highly accurate 3D models. So this was at the museum before the pandemic, uh, just before. So we managed to get the photogrammetry done before the museum was closed for quite an extended period. And in this process, what I was doing, because this is a very large object, um, I, I couldn't put it in a light tent. So I was sort of just walking around it with a camera. So it's the tech, the, the official definition, uh, photogrammetry, the technique of taking multiple overlapping photographs and deriving measurements from them to create 3D models or objects or, or scenes. And you can use these, uh, typo, <laughs> you can use these to create highly realistic digital models from real life objects. And the process that we used was a DSLR camera because we could get very good photographs using that and then run them through. I think most of the objects are on free reality capture, which is a software for the software for photogrammetry, but also sometimes using Metashape, which is a, another comparable um, piece of software as well. And the process is that you first of all create this sort of wire mesh and then eventually it just layers the photographic textures on top so you get something that looks very like the real thing and this was optimized so the photogrammetry process creates very dense models and here I've, I've optimized it just to make sure that the mesh wouldn't be too uh, too heavy and you can see the cradle here in situ uh, inside the living room. And there were other objects that were digitized with photogrammetry, um, such as the Grace Darling's sewing box. And you can see that on top of the chest of drawers. And there was a clock which she would have which she would have heard ticking in her bedroom in the lighthouse. And this was recreated because parts of it were missing and put back into her bedroom on the wall. And the sound of the clock is actually quite integral to the soundtrack. So it's really all these sort of tiny details, but they all come from the museum. And it was thinking about how to, how to position them back into the home again. And there was a bust of Grace Darling as well. And this was actually already scanned by the museum, but we were able to texture it um, and use it for the project. And that sort of sits on the floor next to the desk here. Due to the pandemic and the museum closure, there were some objects that we weren't able to digitize. Um, so what was done was a large, well, quite a few objects were used, were modeled by hand just to, uh, sorry, modeled by hand against reference images again. So there were items such as um, this writing set, which was modeled using reference images of the original and letters from the archives were sort of put on the desk. So again, it was trying to, use as much as we could from the museum and the archives. And other objects were um, based on extensive research. So what kind of things would have been in a lighthouse at that time? And we looked at different furniture, domestic items, you know, for example, a copper kettle and an hourglass and all these small details were built up um, over the year. Other models were inspired by fictional texts, descriptions, describing the house. So across all those books written about her, there's often people that describe what a house would look like, obviously having not been there themselves. So it becomes a 
sort of fictional description. And um, I was also using some of those fictional descriptions to create objects. So it becomes this, uh, this sort of amalgamation of different interpretations, different layers. Uh, there was one extract where the author describes sort of seashells and eggs and things like this in Grace Darling's bedroom. So they were all modeled. And there's a kind of sense that there's a narrative in the in the soundtrack, but there's also a sense of narrative being embedded within the virtual space. So with production, um, once the virtual environment was created, we were able to start filming. And essential to the filming stage was the Unity timeline. Uh, so one of our goals in this project was to keep the amount of uh, custom code to an absolute minimum and lean on the timeline as much as possible for sequencing cameras, turning things on and off, uh, brightness of lights. Uh, also, there's a projector in the scene uh, that we're going to talk about a bit more later that we turn on and off. Uh, also, the, the animation of the lighthouse uh, lamp revolving. Uh, and we, we also had um, two environments um, set up, one for day, day slash dawn and the other for night. Uh, so those would also be turned on and off via the timeline. Um, we did have one custom script uh, for fading lights um, that we found was necessary. Um, but that was, I think that might have been it. For, <laughs> so, so yeah, very heavy usage of timeline. Yeah, and I it was great for me because I, because having worked with film, I was very used to Premiere or After Effects and thinking in, in terms of a timeline. As soon as the timeline's there, it felt very intuitive to actually start thinking about um, filming and sequencing things in this way. You know, we're thinking this is a very early sort of uh, spotting sheet with Kathy doing the, the soundtrack. And we all the way through, we're thinking about time, linear time. So having a, a timeline sort of fits in very well with this particular workflow. The so filming was, um, was fun, really fun. We used Cinemachine, so Unity Cinemachine. And the concept behind the film was to create a sense. It wasn't actually a single take, but the illusion of a single take of a camera that roams through the entire lighthouse and sort of weaves its way up the lighthouse and goes through the story of her life as it does so. And um, so Cinemachine gave us this ability. We were able to use, we'll talk about these different features in more, in, in more detail in a moment, but we were able to use dolly tracks, blending between different cameras. Um, there were three screens and the two side screens are they're not single take. So you've got the central screen, which is a single take, and the two side screens, which are more like static shots. And we're able to use noise. So the static shots had like a gentle handheld motion. Um, and obviously, well, not obviously, but with Cinemachine, it works very, very well with the timeline. So these are all things that were opened up to us for using Cinemachine. And it's, I think it's worth pointing out that the way we used, we used it in a very specific way to make a film, but Cinema machine also can be used for recording games and all sorts of things. So I definitely recommend uh, checking it out to see what's possible. So this is an example of the timeline using Cinema machine. And what you can do is you can blend between cameras seamlessly. So you can have different camera settings and they all just blend between each other and you don't see it as a viewer. Um, which is perfect for things like in camera editing. If you imagine that you might have a camera and as you're, as you're filming, you might pull focus or something like that, you can achieve the same effect using this idea of different camera settings uh, and, and blends. And this was particularly good for the single roaming camera shot, which I've mentioned. And although I think we, I'll come to why we had more work in post in a moment, but theoretically with this approach, you don't, you could do a lot in Unity uh, and export it as a film without having to do so much in post. I mean, you, your cuts could be done in Unity and filmed and exported uh, in that way. So theoretically, it kind of reduces the amount of post in say something like Premiere or After Effects um, for some projects. 
And this is an example. It's very, very subtle, but you can see that the, the camera, uh, the, sorry, the player head's moving across these different blends. And what's happening here is there's a slight full focus on the letter on the desk. So as a camera goes over, it's sort of putting focus on the letter and then it pulls out again. And then as it goes over this letter, it starts to focus on the painting in the background. So all these subtle changes um, in the cameras were achieved by using blends in Cinema Machine. So this was a very subtle effect, but there'll be many, many other uh, sort of points in the film where it was a bit more dramatic. So to achieve the single roaming shot, we use a dolly um, and we use a track. So there's a, you can see this sort of green track, the camera's following this smoothly all the way along. And one of the things that I particularly liked about this process is it uses the same language as filmmaking. It uses the same sort of, you know, it has dollies and cameras and everything feels as if you were filming in the real world, but you're just doing it in a games engine. So you had this sort of transferable uh, language that you were using. So here is, here's like a second part. So it was, it gave the illusion of a single take. It wasn't a single take. There's actually one fade, but this whole green sequence at the top here, I think that's going through three rooms. It's winding its way around and going through many different camera settings along that way. Yeah, there was one for each time of day. There was a track for nighttime and a track for daytime. It was yeah. impossible to, to blur, blur between or fade between the two of them. Yeah, there's a little bit of working post there for, for that section, which we can uh, show more clearly in a minute. You can see here, so this is the camera moving along the tracks and you can see as the as it moves and it's moving through the different settings. It's kind of getting to dark. So as it goes up here, we're changing the lighting and the camera settings so it becomes nighttime. Um, yeah, and that's all through the camera settings, blending all the timeline. So it's camera settings being ISO, etc. Yeah, so we've got some breakdown of the camera settings in a minute, but essentially like depth of field, um, but also color grades as well. So out of the box, Cinema Machine has these different camera types. So you could just say, you know, I want to use a 16 mil or I want to use um, uh, you know, 70 mil, and you can just select those. We use custom settings, um, but it's quite nice to know that those are there. <clears throat> so uh, in terms of the cinematography, um, natural light and lamps uh, have, been, have been used to uh, illuminate the rooms. Uh, we wanted to ensure that the lighting levels and camera settings were physically accurate to keep things looking as realistic as possible. Uh, so we made sure to keep to sort of realistic luminosity for the lights uh, for the sun and the moon. We actually researched how, many, how bright would this lamp actually be. Um, so in a naturally uh, dark environment like a lighthouse at night, uh, it's tempting to uh, over brighten these lamps um, to sort of compensate. However, we stuck to our principle of maintaining physical realism. Uh, so uh, you, the, the adjustments would always be in camera as opposed to in, in, in the environment. Yeah, I mean, some of these rooms had one or two lamps. We were using the sort of like accurate light settings for the lamps and you realized how dark it must have been in real life in those spaces. So there was a lot of balancing with the camera um, to, to actually make it visible on the film. So these are some of the settings in Cinema Machine. You can, different cameras, as we mentioned, can have these different settings and you can change things like lens properties, focal length, clip planes. Um, but very importantly, you can change things like aperture, ISO, uh, shutter speed. This is an interior camera. So um, we've got 2.8 for the aperture and a very high ISO. Again, just trying to compensate for the uh, low light levels. But you don't get all the grain here, which is good. <laughs> and earlier I mentioned that the, the two side cameras are often static shots and to stop them looking like photographs and just to create 
a wobble in the shot as if you were using a monopod or something like that we use noise so what you can do is add a noise profile this is like handheld normal miles I don't know my name conventions but um, you can add a very subtle shake to the camera just so it's constantly moving and just makes it feel more like a film Uh, other settings we used in the project were depth of field extensively um, and bloom, very subtle bloom, but there are, there are quite a lot of things that you can do in Unity uh, for post-processing. And this would be very good if you were filming something real time or you didn't go into post, but you just wanted to do absolutely as much as you could in the game engine. Depth of field is important to avoid. It makes it look less like a game, I guess. Uh, where everything would could be in focus, uh, it makes it have a depth of field and appear more realistic. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think also um, just being like with the pulling focus on the things that are important, just using the camera to to pull out the bits you want the viewer to look at to to help with the storytelling. So the post processing, you can add lots of different things. Um, vignettes you can play with the white balance and you can also do basic color correction and I say basic I mean it's, it's not that basic it's something but you've got your color wheels and you can change your brightness and things like this actually in in the game engine and color was really important to this project we were trying to create this emotive response to the film and and move from the whole thing moves from a sort of morning and as you go up the lighthouse, it kind of progresses to dark, um, more towards the end of her life. And here, the sort of, you know, the, the, the dawn was very peachy, very optimistic. And then we went through these kind of greens and then out to the, the dark blues at the end. So um, in terms of the colouring, the approach that we took for this project was to approach it as we would have a film. Uh, and collaborate with uh, someone to do the color grade, which was interesting. So uh, the color grading was done using lookup textures or LUT files, and that meant that the what would happen is I'd send a still of the you know the environment to the color grader, um, and then we would in an external software. This was DaVinci. We were sort of able to have a lot of control over the color, more control than using the color wheels in Unity. Um, and once that was all colored in DaVinci, I would get the LUT file back. And the LUT file is the file that kind of contains all the color information. And in Unity, you can just drop the LUT file into the tone mapping option to apply the colors to your camera. And it was an interesting process because it works well, but one of the kind of major limitations for us is that when you blend between cameras, you can't blend LUT files. So that kind of, it brought this ability to have lovely color grades, but it introduced this issue that you then couldn't blend between cameras because what would happen is as you went from one camera to the next with different LUT files, there'd be a hard change, um, which meant more, more work in post. And I think that when you're on a, you know, working on a project like this, lots of things come up that you hadn't anticipated and it's all, it's all learning, but that was definitely an interesting learning uh, takeaway for us. Um, so we didn't want to break the principle of a camera that moves through the lighthouse in a single take, which presented an issue for the section of the story where there's a storm at sea because we didn't then want to take people out of the lighthouse and put them out in the storm at sea. So it's like, how do you tell that part of the story without breaking the single take? So, so to solve this, um, when the camera comes in uh, at the start, You'll notice there's a boat on, on the rocks. Uh, so we created a kind of seagoing version of this using Unity's uh, physics capabilities and placed it out at sea at night, uh, which we then filmed and then uh, took that film uh, as an MP4, I think it was, and then uh, projected it on the wall using a, an asset. Uh, we found a uh, projector asset. Projector simulator, I think it's called. It was fun. It was like a film, making a film within a film within a film, and you could imagine sort of projection within a projection, but it works well for, for our purposes for this project. 
And what you hear is when you're going into the room, you see this sort of projection of the boat at sea. It's quite abstract, but you, you hear um, Grace Arnie's mother recalling the night of the rescue for a, um, a letter. So this is the projection here. And what we did was we, we used the timeline to turn the projector on and off. So when you come in the room, you look at the wall, but you don't want the projector there. And then as you turn, the projector comes on. So when you turn back again, it's it's playing and all these different sort of um, sequencing abilities were, were done in timeline. So finally, the, the sort of final bit, once we had done all the modeling and we had all the, the, the cameras in place, um, was recording and, and post-production. So from Unity, you can export very simply high resolution video files using uh, Unity Recorder. So here, um, the, the, the cameras were, the footage from the cameras is exported as, in as high quality as possible. So I think it was ProRes in the end that we were using, which took a fair amount of time to render, but the logic there is that we would, you know, get the highest quality before then editing it and exporting it. This, this is where the fast graphics card came in handy for doing the renders yeah <laughs> very handy indeed because it was quite quite a lot of rendering at this stage um and then because of the issue what well, issue you know because because we had stuff to do in post um we then took the film from we took those those film files and imported them to uh, after effects for editing which included things like crossfades so crossfades between uh, the different lot cuts um and adding the audio and um adding credit. So it was it was a minimal amount of post-production, um, but nonetheless, it, it did then go on into After Effects. So you can see the timeline here. Um, very simple edit, just got your different, different camera takes um, and then editing it. And actually, because the renders took so long, it was quite handy doing this post step because if there were, say, a section that you had to reshoot, you could then just cut and edit that bit into your your After Effects file rather than have to render the whole thing out again. So it did start to speed things up at certain points. And the outcome was the three screen installation that was shown at the museum um, in September. And it's the installation itself, each screen is about 2.5 meters wide. So it really took up this whole space at the top of the museum. And we use projectors for this. So you had sort of three projectors um, central camera is essentially the single screen version so it's a that's the roaming camera and then these two cameras on the sides just picking up more detail in the rooms and it was originally on for one month it was extended for two and I think over the the two months that it was up there was something like 10,000 viewers looking at it and apart from one lamp blowing <laughs> there were no glitches so that was uh, I think it sort of it, it was it was low maintenance as we hoped but also a museum were we're very pleased with the outcome. So, um, oh, and we also wanted to get the most out of the sound. So we had stereo and also a bass. It's a lot of bass in the soundtrack, which really uh, came through in that particular setup. And that is, I believe, uh, the end of our talk. So thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. And uh, we'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, key. So the project, the project took longer than we thought. I think there are lots of lockdown projects like this. So the project was initially going to take a year from start to installation. Um, because of lockdown, we it took an extra year. So we weren't working on it full time for two years, but the whole project did take that period that that period of time. Um, so it's probably a, a year project stretched over two years. But then also, I think when something goes on that long, you kind of, the inclination is to keep keep chipping away so you find yourself, particularly during lockdown, sort of decorating a lighthouse a bit more than you should. Um, but yeah, it took, it took a while. It was a labour of love, though, for you as well, of course. Yeah, it's a good project to work on. Um, what did we learn from doing it? How much did you already know? Is that uh, in terms of sort of tech technical learning or just general learning? Um, 
I think we learned a lot probably in many regards. We learned a lot about, well, I could talk for myself, but um, we learned a lot more about using the HGRP. So this is the first sort of HGRP project we've done. Prior to that, we have done a lot of web-based experiences or VR experiences or XR experiences where the whole, the whole game is about optimization. It's about making things kind of as, you know, as optimized as possible. Um, so this was a, a, a good learning curve and also a very fun one because actually for the first time ever, I didn't have to worry about optimization. So it was learning a lot about HGRP and also just pushing the, the limits of what's possible uh, in, in terms of, you know, um, realism, lighting, uh, materials. And I think, yeah, basically a lot, a lot around the HGLP through this project. Yeah. Also, things like uh, how, to, how to do the ocean, and things like that, various kind of unity features that were new to us. Yeah, ray tracing. Um, and I think also with the new, so we've got the graphics card as part of this project. So it just sort of opened up a whole load of pushing everything to maximum settings and just waiting to see if the computer melts or handles it. So, um, but I think also I've done sort of multi-channel films before, uh, but not, not in a games engine. So this was the first film made entirely in a game engine that um, I'd worked on. And it's interesting because a lot of the learning from filmmaking was transferable, as I mentioned earlier. So, you know, all, all the things that you learn about filmmaking, you could take into this project, but there were certainly things that are unique to a game engine that we face in this particular project. Um, and I think a lot of those things were overcome with Cinemachine, but I guess it's about the sort of practicalities of having three different cameras doing three different things and, and pulling that all together. But yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much for this. If there are no more questions. Sorry, uh, Marta, I think I'll speak. Yeah. To you. Yes, I can hear you. Sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Sophie and Ed, and thanks everyone for coming. Uh, two important pieces of information for you. We will be sending you a feedback survey afterwards, so we would really appreciate uh, if you could just spend two minutes uh, to fill it out. Uh, and also we'll be releasing all of our uh, tech talks and master classes soon, either to the ticket holders or onto the website, depending on the uh, session. So please follow us on our social media channels, Threshold Studios, uh, to get our regular updates on them. And so, yeah, I think if there are any, no more questions, you can also send your questions to our email address from which you got the link, Digital Democracies at Threshold Studios. Um, so uh, we'll pass them on to Sophie and Ed uh, if you come up with any questions afterwards. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank Thanks you. So. Thank you for having us and thank you everyone for coming. And yeah, by all means, any questions after the talk, we'd be happy to, to, to help answer those. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.